Looks pretty fun, huh? Anybody want to go? Let's go crash that youth party, huh? <laughs> How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Good to be here. Uh, to second time we've been in this place on a Sunday morning, and it, it feels good. I, I think we'll stay here for a while. What do you think? Good to be here. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name's uh, Terry, for those who have never met me, and uh, I'm glad you're here. Hey, let's open up in a word of prayer, and we got a special Palm Sunday message for you today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we turn our attention to your word, we pray, Father God, that you would lay hold of our hearts and speak to us in a way that only you can. We welcome you to do that, Lord. We, we welcome you to speak to us, to correct us, to remind us of who you are, how great you are, how holy you are, how merciful you are. We want to know you, Lord. We want to know you more. And uh, we just thank you for this day that we observe that triumphal entry into Jerusalem, our Jesus, our King, our Savior. And um, I pray that as I speak these things from your word, Lord, that um, they would be well received by all, all that are here and all that are listening. And we pray by the power of your spirit that you would minister to each individual. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're taking a little break from our series through the book of Genesis, kind of left it with a cliffhanger, and we are doing um, resurrection-related messages. Uh, Palm Sunday would be today, of course, and so we're going to look at what happened or what occurred there a couple thousand years ago. I've titled the message today, Once Upon a Donkey. And that probably makes sense to most of you. You know that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a humble little donkey's colt. We'll be looking at John chapter 12, verses 9 through 26. Palm Sunday, the very first Palm Sunday, the day of our Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem shortly before his arrest and all that tragedy at the cross. And so I want to invite you today, invite you this morning to go back in time with me and actually picture yourself among the multitudes as Jesus enters into the holy city. You're there with your sandals on, with palm branches in your hands, and you're waving those palm branches. And so I want you to consider all that took place, pay attention to the words of Jesus, what, what he had to say, and We'll also examine what others had to say about him. He was both hailed and hated. And we'll visit both sides of the fence, those who believed in him and those who wanted him killed. All that and more. The greatest story ever told. And so it breaks down like this. John chapter 12, verses 9 through 26. and verses 9 through 11, we see the deadly plot against Jesus. There's some that uh, want Jesus killed, and they're getting together to make that happen. And then we go to the triumphant entry. Jesus enters into Jerusalem on that humble little coat, cult, and people are praising him and worshiping him and declaring him as king. And uh, there's other reaction as well, as we see in verses 17 through 19, while all the praise and worship is going on, there are those who want him dead. So I call that a mixed reaction in verses 17 through 19. And then Jesus talks about how his hour has come in those last verses we'll be looking at, verses 20 through 26. So let's dive in. We begin with the deadly plot against Jesus as we read from verses 9 to 11. John chapter 12, verses 9 through 11, it goes like this. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he, knew that Jesus was there. And they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, Many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So this all happens on the heels of Lazarus being raised from the dead. 
When Jesus performed that miracle, as you can imagine, news traveled. And there was a lot of talk. Jesus rose the stick. I mean, he was in the tomb. He was in grave clothes. And Jesus called him out, and he came popping out, and he was, uh, he was alive. And, and talk of this spread, and people were saying, you got to see this fellow. And so many were coming to Jesus. So Jesus hasn't yet entered into Jerusalem. He's very close, just a couple miles away. He's in a small town called Bethany. And it's at this stage where religious leaders are plotting to kill him. The priest, can can you imagine that? Priest of all people, the religious leaders of the community, and, and they're talking about how best to kill Jesus. And well, why do they want him dead? Because multitudes were flocking to him. Multitudes wanted to come see him. And this miracle that they heard about, it says that they went away and they believed in Jesus. They went away from where? Well, they were fleeing the priest in favor of Christ. And and some of you perhaps can relate to that. You forsook a religious stronghold in pursuit of a loving, gracious Savior. And that's how Christianity all started way back when. People forsaking a religious stronghold in favor of a meaningful relationship with Jesus. Many believed after hearing of of Lazarus, a great many it says, scores, multitudes. They came to see for themselves. They're asking, where is this Lazarus? Where is the one who raised him up? It was a miracle that nobody could deny. The priests, they tried to explain it away, but people were losing trust in them. They were turning to the truth, and the truth had set them free. So the priests, they're up in arms. They're upset. We've got to stop this. Something must be done. Lazarus must be silenced. Put an end to him. Put an end to all this talk of, of Jesus. Put an end to this movement once and for all. These priests were losing control. A plot is set into motion. Kill Lazarus. Kill Jesus. Kill them both. So the plot begins before Jesus even steps foot into Jerusalem. Things only accelerate there. It's only a matter of time. Well, as we pick up in verse 12, this is where the triumphant entry begins. It says this, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. And they cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. So now we come to Palm Sunday, Jesus' grand entry into the holy city, Jerusalem. And as he enters in, again, picture yourself there. You're among the multitudes. And what do you see? You see palm branches here, there, everywhere. Everybody waving palm branches at Jesus. Why palm branches? Well, why not? Uh, think of them as extensions, uh, extensions of one's own palms. I mean, take a look at the palms here. I mean, they, they fan out just like yours and, and just like mine, as if they were worshiping the heavens. The temple, the original temple of Jerusalem, had palm trees engraved on the walls and on the doors. Maybe we should have thought of that when we built this place, just palm trees engraved on the walls and the doors. 
And this, of course, was according to God's instruction. This is what I want you to do. He he spoke this to Solomon. I, I want palm trees or palm branches engraved on the doors and on the walls. A symbol of worship. The Apostle John, when he had that revelation, he speaks of it in, in the book of Revelation, of course, and he, he, he was one of the few people that got a sneak peek of heaven. And guess what? Everybody was waving. They're all gathered around the throne, and guess what? Everyone was waving. John writes about it, Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. I looked and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with what? Palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Multitudes. Next time you see a palm tree, I hope that, you know, clicks. May it prompt you to raise your own palms and worship. Jesus. And so it was when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. The palms come out. Everybody's waving. He comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, they shout, or save us. And Jesus is declared as the King of Israel. Here he comes, the King of Israel, the King of Israel, save us. Now, some saw, them as, saw him as a political savior. They wanted to be saved from the clutches of, of Rome. They, they hoped that he would overthrow Roman rule, you know, make Israel great again. <laughs> but, but he didn't come to conquer government. He came to conquer hearts. He came to conquer death. Fear not, Jesus cries. Your king has come sitting on a donkey's colt. I'm on a colt. I'm not on a stallion. I'm not at a chariot here. He came humbly on a colt, a different type of king. And Jesus, when he says these words, your king comes sitting on a donkey's colt, he was actually quoting from Zechariah, Chapter 9, verse 9. You see, Jesus was fulfilling prophecy on this very day. He enters in Jerusalem, into Jerusalem on a cult, and Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 predicted that's how it would be. Let, let's look at it where Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Your king's coming. He has salvation. He's just. He's righteous. And he comes lowly, humbly, on a humble beast, a donkey's colt. Fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, There's even an earlier reference that goes back even before Zechariah. Uh, Genesis chapter 49. Now, we're going through Genesis on Sunday morning. I'm going to give you a preview of coming attractions. But in Genesis chapter 49, that's when old father Jacob is passing away and he has his 12 sons gathered and he's laying hands on each of them. And, you know, Jacob, he's Israel and his sons will be the forefathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. So he gathers them together and he's prophesying over each one of them. And when he comes to Judah, Jesus was to come from the tribe of Judah. And he comes to Judah and we read in Genesis chapter 49, verses 10 and 11, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. What does that mean? The rule, the reign will not depart from Judah. The eternal reign. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. Shiloh is another name for Messiah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. 
binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. Who is the choice vine? Who is it that said, I am the vine and you are the branches? That's our Jesus. And all the way back to Genesis, the first book in the Bible, we see this prophecy that Jesus, the choice vine, would be bound to a colt, a lowly colt. And then on that Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago, it actually happens. Now, maybe you read Genesis chapter 49 before. Maybe you read Zechariah chapter 9 before. And uh, that just, you just kind of missed that. It just kind of went right over you. you. You didn't make the connection that, oh, yeah, Jesus, this, the Christ, that. Oh, yeah, I, I see it uh, now, but it, it didn't make sense before. Well, <laughs> you know, the apostles... There was a lot that went over their head as well. Uh, they didn't quite make the connection from the things that they saw and they witnessed to what Jesus was doing as fulfillment of prophecy or things that Jesus said. And the light didn't go on immediately like, oh, yeah, now I get it. It's, they were kind of slow to pick up on things. Uh, look at verse 16 in John chapter 12. All this is going on and Jesus says this, you know, rejoice so greatly, uh, daughter of Zion, your king comes on a colt. And look at verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, when Jesus died and was resurrected, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Oh yeah, now it makes sense. The apostles, they didn't pick up initially when Jesus was walking with them. It wasn't until after the resurrection that they began to connect the dots. Oh, now I get it. Oh, yeah, Zechariah mentioned a cult. And, hey, wasn't it Zechariah mentioned, who mentioned that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver? How much did Judas get? Isaiah 53 Jesus, the Christ, will be led like a lamb to the slaughter. Psalm 22, very specific, that they would pierce his hands and his feet and that guards would be at his feet gambling for his garments. And they're putting all this together. Wow, yet yeah, Jesus prophesied, whoa, mind blower. Those are only a few examples out of many, many others. You see, there's, there's truths in the Bible that oftentimes we, we, we miss. And we especially miss them when we don't know Jesus. And maybe that was your experience. You weren't quite a believer yet. You tried picking up the Bible. You tried to make sense of it. And it's like, oh, I don't get it. It just kind of went right over your head. And then you gave your life to Christ and that's when the light started clicking on, right? Wow, I didn't see that before. You know, it, Paul talks about, you know, looking into a mirror dimly. You know, back in those days, they had very dim mirrors. They didn't have like what we have where you see an exact reflection. Years ago, I was in Sudan, in the bushes, where there's no electricity, no plumbing. People live in, you know, mud huts, and it was very primitive living from what I was used to. And I, my quarters were this little tiny itty-bitty room with a cot in it, and outside there was this tree that had this piece of tin nailed to it where you could kind of look at yourself and comb your hair and fix yourself up. And it's like, I'm looking at this thing, and it's like, I can't really see myself. This is too blurry. And so like, I'm not going to try shaving myself here. I'll just be all full of cuts. It's like, so I just let myself go. Yeah, I was there for two weeks, a little over two weeks, actually. And I come back, and I look in a real mirror, and it's like, what the heck happened? I saw things clearly. Sometimes it's like that with the Word of God too. Like you're, uh, 
in your BC days and, you know, you're not really catching that, that image that you're supposed to see and then you give your life to Christ and, wow, now I see it. There it is. Some things in the Bible are very plain. They're, they're very clear. The gospel, for example, God wants everybody to get it. He wants the world to know of his amazing love and what he did to save the lost and how Jesus died for all mankind. And yet, there are mysteries in the Bible that the world cannot comprehend. It's up to Christ to reveal them. And that's why he spoke in parables. Uh, the apostles, they actually approached Jesus and asked him that question, why do you tell these stories? Why do you speak in parables? You know, why don't you just come right out and say what you want to say? Why, why all the stories and analogies and illustrations? It, it's recorded in Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 through 13. The t disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? Them would be the unbelievers, the Pharisees, the skeptics, and he, Jesus, answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, the unbeliever, the God-rejecting people, it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they will not hear, nor do they understand. I could shoot straight with them, but they're not going to get it, because they reject everything I have to say. So I speak in parables. You have been given this insight to know the mysteries of God. So there are things that we understand, that we get, that are meaningful to us, that just uh, go flat on those who are not in Christ. You know, I can say to you, I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Well, you don't go in front of a bunch of unbelievers and say, I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You know, they're going to say, you've been what? What's up with that? And to us, it's like, yeah, amen, hallelujah, me too. And they're thinking, that's just weird. <laughs> now, certainly we want to talk about the blood of Christ when we're witnessing. I mean, there's a, a way to do that. But some of the things that we understand as being part of the family of God, it's going to go over their heads. Here's why. Paul explains it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. To understand spiritual truths, you must be born of the Spirit. If you're not born of the Spirit, spiritual things aren't going to make a whole lot of sense to you. Until one is born again, born of the Spirit, they cannot understand the deeper things of God. Such mysteries are just weird to them. We, we think the opposite. Oh, that's so deep. It's so powerful. It's so rich. Oh, man, keep going. Tell me more. Tell me more. We hang things on our walls like crosses and doves and fish and trinity emblems. And the world thinks, how silly. What is all that? And no wonder why we hesitate to share our faith because we don't want to be thought of as foolish or peculiar or weird. And so here's my advice. If that's you, get over it. <laughs> I mean, get over it. I mean, lives are at stake. The world is in desperate need of Jesus. And if the cost of saving souls is being thought of as a fool, so be it. Get over it. Jesus paid a much higher price. Well, let's pick up on our story in verse 17 where we see this mixed reaction happening. Therefore, the people who were with him, with Jesus, when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead, they bore witness for this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. So that's one group. And then the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. That's group number two. They're upset. They don't like this. 
But I don't want you to miss what, what's happening here. These people who bore witness to Jesus, they bore witness to his power, to his authority. This Jesus, he raises the dead. Who else can do that? Who else has that power, that authority? He must be God. Only God can do that. And so they bear witness to the power of God in Jesus Christ. He raises the dead. And what happens next? People come to meet him. And that's how it works today. We bear witness to Jesus. We bear witness to his authority and his power. He raises the dead. He raised himself up. He raised me up. That's our Jesus. And that's the testimony of every believer. We're to be witnesses. Nowhere in the Bible does it say we're to be judges. God will handle that. We're to be witnesses. And what do witnesses do? We bear testimony. We bear testimony. Jesus raises the dead. You don't wake the dead by wagging your finger at them. What's the matter with you? Only the risen Lord can wake them. So we testify to his power. I want to highlight what we saw in our text. It says people met him because they heard that he had done this. That he had done this sign. The resurrection of Lazarus was a sign. A sign of what? Our Lord's power over death his authority over death. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul says, God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us, us up by his power. The same God that raised himself up raises you up. That's the message we preach. The resurrection of Lazarus was a sign. It was a preview of coming attractions, our Lord's resurrection. And news of Lazarus, it spread like wildfire. There was a lot of witnessing going on and a lot of people coming to Jesus. Now, before it was the chief priests that were all upset and wanting to stop Jesus, kill him. Well, the Pharisees, now we see that they're in on it as well. They call a meeting and that's when the finger pointing stop or starts. You're accomplishing nothing. The world's gone after him. That was the big worry. The world was going after Jesus. Listen to this from the previous chapter, chapter 11, verses 47 and 48. It says the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and they said, what shall we do for this man? Jesus works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. We can't let this continue. We got to put a stop to all this talk about Jesus. We got to silence these people, why? They didn't want to lose their place, their position, their power. They didn't want to lose their influence over the nation. They were losing power. People were escaping their oppression and finding true freedom in Christ Jesus. And that is very upsetting to control freaks. Well, on the heels of this comes a, a fun little story that I really like. It's verses 20 through 22, or 26, but we'll start with verses 20 through 22. It says, now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. So predominantly Jews, you know, all there at the entry of Jerusalem, welcoming Jesus. Here's our king. They're the ones waving the palm branches. But there were a few Greeks or Gentiles who, who came up at that same time. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. 
And Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. <laughs> I love this story. Uh, we wish to see Jesus. Wouldn't you love that if someone came up to you and said, we want to know Jesus? Yeah, I'll, I'll take you. We wish to see Jesus. Hey, I have the same wish. How about you? I have that wish. I, I wish to see Jesus. I, I look forward to that when he, he returns. And Philip, he has these people coming to him. We wish to see Jesus. He must have been pretty darn excited. He, he tells Andrew, hey, I'm taking some guys to see Jesus. And then Andrew gets excited. You're taking people to see Jesus? I want to go. I want to go. And off they go. And before long, they're face to face with Christ himself. And they're there. And... I don't know what they're expecting to hear, but they probably weren't expecting to hear what they heard. <laughs> Look at this in verse 23. It says, Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. And if it dies, it produces much grain. Here's Greeks. And they're saying, that sounds Greek to me. It's like, what? What are you talking about? They're all scratching their heads, looking at each other, all puzzled. I don't know. I, uh, what's wheat got to do with anything? Jesus, you talk funny. You're just not making any sense. And there is a lesson to this parable of the wheat. And behind that message is this. Get ready to meet the real Jesus. Get ready to meet the real Jesus. You see, perhaps they were more interested in meeting the celebrity Jesus or the great teacher Jesus. Or perhaps they wanted to meet the miracle worker Jesus. But were they ready to meet the real Jesus the Jesus who'd fall to the ground and die alone like a grain of wheat. Is that the Jesus that you know? Or the Jesus that you've come to know? And if that's the Jesus that you know, the Jesus that went to the ground and died, that Jesus says to you, Follow me. We too must be like that wheat if we're to bear any grain or any fruit at all, we must die to our old nature. Jesus went on to say to these Greeks in verse 25, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. This is what it takes to follow Jesus. Do as he did. We choose the hereafter over the here and now. We lose our earthly life in favor of life eternal. We die to the flesh and come alive to the spirit. We have to die to that old person. And this is why many reject him. It's why many put them off. It's why I put them off for so long. I didn't want to die to myself. As wretched as my life was, as miserable as it was, I wasn't ready to die to myself and surrender to Jesus. I was focused on the here and now. I was focused on this world. And this world, it's not that pretty. 
The Apostle Paul describes the world like this in the day we live in, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. The Apostle Paul says, know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Welcome to that world. He goes on to say, describe this world, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, uh, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Does that sound like our world? Just go on Facebook for five minutes. <laughs> that's what you find. And that's what we die to. We die to all of that. You see, we're to be lovers of God, not lovers of pleasure, not lovers of ourselves, not lovers of money. Above all, we're to be lovers of God. And that's where the Lord nailed me back when I was a young man in my early 20s. I was caught up in the world, but my attitude was, what's the harm? Who am I hurting? I'm not bothering anybody. I'm doing my own thing. Just let me be. But I was miserable. And I was living in this home that was very dark and very smoky. And there was a lot of traffic coming in and out of the house, wanting to purchase some of the stuff that made our house smoky. <laughs> and just one evening, I'm in this darkness and in this cloud and all these people around just messed up and I just began to wonder, what am I doing here? And I started thinking about the words of this fellow at work that he was sharing with me the gospel. And it was just like, I couldn't shake it. And so I just walked away from everything. I went in my room and I had this Bible that my sister had given me on my 14th birthday, which I never read because it was a holy Bible. You know, Holy Bible, you, you put on your nightstand for good luck. You don't touch it. So I didn't, I didn't touch it, but it's like, maybe I got to crack this thing open. I didn't know where to turn because I didn't know any book of the Bible. I, didn't, I never heard of Genesis or Revelation or anything in between. I, I, I just knew it, it was, this was a holy book. And, but I, I, I opened it up. And... Letters in red just jumped out at me. Words of Jesus. Where he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And those words broke me. That was a sin that I had to confess I knew that God existed. I knew that he was the creator. I knew that he had sent his son and all that stuff. But here I am guilty of the greatest commandment. I did not love God. And I fell on my face and I confessed that to him. I said, Lord, I don't love you. I want to change that. Forgive me. I have not loved you. And I just fell on my face, literally. I, I was on the ground crying. I'm sorry, Lord, that I have not loved you. Forgive me. And he washed me that moment. 
and all those tears, you just washed away and all the guilt that I carried all the years and all the shame and all the anger and all the bitterness, he washed away and he replaced it with his peace. And so I went from mourning and crying to praising and worshiping God. I found new life in him and my life has not it, it, it just hasn't been the same since. That's when I came to know Jesus. The world says learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. I could think of two initials for that, but I'll just say it's hogwash. It's baloney. Sounds good. That's, but it's, you know, not the greatest love of all. It's not the way of Jesus. Learning to die to yourself is the greatest love of all. It truly is. And, and you can't know that till you've actually been there. Like that wheat, we must die to self. We must die to that old nature. Die to that dying nature. And only then does Jesus raise us up. We wake up to a whole new world. It's true. We wake up to a whole new world and all things become new. We become a new creation, alive to the Spirit and alive to Christ Jesus. We discover new life in Him. And if you have not discovered that life, I invite you to die to yourself. Die to that old nature. And Jesus has the power and the desire to raise you up and make all things new. He'll do that for you. Die to this world and raise up, be raised up to life eternal. If you've never done that, I want to lead you in a prayer. Or maybe you have done that and some... Where down the road you just kind of drifted off, I want to lead you back to that place where things were good and you were enjoying that life of abundance in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for each individual here. Thank you for my brothers and sisters, my family in Christ. And I thank you for those who are not here, for those who are listening online right now or listening to the recording. Thank you, Father God. And I pray, Lord, that these words would take root into each of our hearts. Lord, we give you praise and declare you as our King and our Savior. At the same time, we pray for those who don't know you in that way. Remove the veils. Open their eyes so that they can see the great and awesome God you are. The loving and gracious God you are. And if you're ready to surrender your life to the Lord, to Christ Jesus, if you're ready to die to yourself, and be raised up a new creation, I want to invite you to pray with me. Or maybe you're like what I said earlier, you, you, you did that once upon a time, but you've gotten off track. You, know, you can make this your prayer as well. Recommit. Heavenly Father, I'm grateful for what you did on my behalf. I'm grateful, Lord, that you, you took my sin to the cross and died for me, shed blood for me so that I could be saved, so that I could be cleansed. And today I choose you. 
I lay myself down. I lay my life down. I'm ready to die to this world and to become a new creation. And I recognize that's only something you can do. And so I pray, Father God, that I could experience that miracle of new life. Save me from myself. Forgive me of my sins. Raise me up a new creature, one that loves you and worships you and serves you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.